From the Mumbai studios of Republic TV, it's time for Arnab Goswami on the debate. since the war began and I think Putin is tiring out. He's looking nervous. His address to the Russian people is showing signs of repetition and uncertainty. Putin is uncertain how it's going to pan out, how it's going to end. Putin has started publicly acknowledging the economic squeeze. He is admitting a huge loss of incomes for the Russian people. He's publicly talking about providing benefits to the Russian people to compensate. He's talking about increasing price rise in Russia. He's also increasingly harping on the great Western conspiracy against the people of Russia. That is 80% of his focus of late. The focus is no longer military. The focus is no longer quick and devastating military conquest by Russia. No. No longer is his narrative about the huge military prowess of Russia, how Ukraine can be defeated. No. His tone instead is a bit defensive. It's about hanging in there. It's about staying united against the West. It's about not letting the West defeat the morale of the Russian people or divide the Russian people. Yes, there is a shift in tone. The tone of Putin is no longer that of a leader who's absolutely certain how it's going to end and more importantly, when it's going to end. He's talking instead about difficult times, economic risk. He's acknowledging the price rise, inflation, and about the challenges that are being faced by Russia and international trade, Putin will never admit it, ladies and gentlemen. But he is worried now about the response of the Russian people. Putin is nervous. That's why hashtag tonight is hashtag Putin nervous. And that is something that wasn't even articulated or a point of concern till 10 days back. So yes, three weeks since the war began, Putin is talking big about leaving the tough times behind, but I think he's not sure anymore. Especially after hearing him today, he's not sure how exactly he's going to do that. With no immediate victory in sight, my reading is this. Putin will talk big at home, but behind the scenes, ladies and gentlemen, he's going to seek a quick compromise soon. That's my gut feel. Let's see where this goes. Debate one. Hashtag Putin nervous. He's nervous, he won't admit it, but he is. Debate number two tonight. And joining me on top of the show, I have the former National Security Advisor to the US government, John Bolton. My second debate at 10 tonight is about respecting the court verdict. I cannot accept how people are going to have buns against a court verdict. That's totally unacceptable. That's saying we don't respect the law in this country. We don't respect the courts. And here are the headlines, ladies and gentlemen, this Wednesday evening on the debate tonight. The ICJ has ruled on Ukraine's genocide claim Russia has been asked to suspend its military operation. We are asking for a reply, for an answer uh, to this uh, terror from the whole world. Is this a lot to ask for? To create a no-fly zone, zone over Ukraine to save people. Is this too much to ask? Zelensky addresses the US Congress wants a global alliance to counter Russian aggression. Remember September the 11th, a terrible day in 20, 2001. Our country experienced the same every day. Zelensky compares the attack on Ukraine to 9-11, says we need a global counter within 24 hours if needed. We have every reason to believe that next to Russia, in Ukraine, next to Russian borders, they were basically creating components for a biological weapon. So we have, and in this regard, we were forced to launch this special military operation. Putin addresses the West directly, starts looking nervous, says the West is trying to weaken Russia for decades now.
Bombings continue, civilians are directly hit, videos send shockwaves around the world. An issue settled by the courts, but the unseen hand wants to protest and block the streets over the judicial order on hijab. And ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, the International Court of Justice at The Hague has given its view on the Russian aggression. The Hague has ruled that the attacks have hit civilians and that Russia must halt its military operations immediately. So today marks a turning point. Will Putin pull back now? Can he afford to carry on? Let's debate. Reason behind taking up arms and is it the one of the most challenging experience of your life? You know, you're right. It's uh, one of the toughest experience of my life because, but uh, at the same time, it's the easiest experience because I am on my own land. They... Russian troops have already fired nearly 1,000 missiles at Ukraine. Countless bombs. They use drones to kill us with precision. This is a terror that Europe has not seen, has not seen for 80 years. And we are asking for a reply, for an answer uh, to this uh, terror from the whole world. Is this a lot to ask for? To create a no-fly zone, zone over Ukraine to save people. No, no, yeah, In all his addresses to world leaders, President of Ukraine Vladimir Zelensky has always exhorted that it is time that the world stands united to protect Ukraine. In his latest address to the US Congress, he says there is a need for a new alliance, an alliance which is going to respond within 24 hours if any country faces an aggression like Ukraine has. We have every reason to believe that next to Russia, in Ukraine, next to Russian borders, they were basically creating components for a biological weapon. And our numerous warns that such developments have poses direct threat to the safety of Russia. They were rejected by Ukraine and by their patrons from the US. And they did it in a very brazen way. For the first time, Russia has indicated that the negotiations that they are having with Ukraine is showing some positive signs. In fact, for the first time, Vladimir Putin also made a mention of the fact that these negotiations are taking place with Ukraine, but once again, hitting out at the West, saying that the West does not understand Russia, does not understand the fact that Russia is protecting their values. This is the center of Donetsk with a deliberate attack on the civilian area by Ukraine forces. A civilian bus with a man killed. Oh my God. Uh, we have to do many things at the same time. We need to strengthen our air and missile defense. We are doing that. We need to invest more in advanced conventional capabilities. From day one of the invasion, Ukraine has made multiple appeals for a no-fly-out zone. But NATO has ruled that out. US President Joe Biden says that a no-fly-out zone is necessary or else this is going to be a full-fledged war between the West and Russia. NATO has also indicated that they are prepared and they are prepared for a long battle and they are going to protect each member of this alliance. First, Ambassador John Bolton is former National Security Advisor of the U.S. Uh, and former Ambassador to the U.N. for the United States. Ambassador Bolton, did you expect it to go so long? Is, is Putin showing sign of nerves? How long is he going to hold up? 
Well, I think uh, most military observers are quite surprised that uh, the Russian effort is bogged down the way it is, uh, and the estimates of Russia's ability to uh, uh, to win were were rated pretty high pretty early, and uh, that has obviously not happened. And I think that's uh, potentially quite significant because uh, at some point the supply of weapons and and uh, other material to uh, Ukraine might might be enough to establish a situation where the Russians can't make further progress, uh, and that would be a huge reputational blow uh, to the Russian military. I think that's why Putin at the moment is not interested in negotiation. Why I think uh, the likelihood is this this is uh, this war will continue and continue to escalate. So if it continues to escalate, you know, I, I also heard him today when he was talking to his own people on a, on a television address and he talked about the economic consequences of war, he talked about job losses, he talked about inflation, he talked about the need for the Russians to stay together. I, I thought uh, some total he, he seemed more nervous than he did a week back. Well, I think he has reason to be, to be nervous. He clearly didn't expect this. It's why, according to press reports anyway, he's put two of his top intelligence officials under house arrest. He's obviously not happy there. He can't be happy with the military's performance. Not that I see his position in Russia uh, being in jeopardy, but I think he's a savvy enough politician that, that he's acknowledging what must be pretty evident to Russians all across the country that this is not going well. They're, they're hearing from their sons on the battlefield, if nothing else, that uh, they're, not, they're not where they expected to be. But as I say, I think this, the, the way this looks now, Putin has to achieve some kind of success, however he defines it, that permits him to say, I have now made my point and I'm prepared to negotiate. That would be coming from a position of strength Right now, I don't think he's in that position. And he obviously has to take something, something for, the, uh, for the Russian people. He has to take something back for the Russian people as a visible sign of success, which, which he can then say, you know, this is success. Uh, what would that visible sign be? Because he needs to determine that himself. And he needs to position that and put it all across Russian media that we have achieved success. What would that be? What would that that's, be? Well, that's right. I, no, I, I fundamentally agree with that. I, I think the first element of that has got to be a significant military victory. Perhaps that's taking control of the capital, Kiev. Perhaps it's finally getting control of the north shore of the Black Sea, which is a huge strategic uh, uh, issue for the Russians. But something like that, as opposed to what they've got now, which is a grinding, uh, inconclusive uh, situation. Now, I, I have thought for some time that what Putin's ultimate objective is, is to take control of a pretty significant uh, amount of Ukrainian territory that is primarily Russian culturally, uh, Russian linguistically, Russian Orthodox in faith, not, not Christian or Ukrainian speaking, uh, and, and, uh, and say that that constitutes his victory. He's not there yet. Uh, but if he were able to achieve that, whether he captured Kiev or not, then I think he could say, yes, this is what we want. We have, in effect, reunited the primarily Russian, culturally Russian parts of the country with Mother Russia itself. For that, for that there needs to be an acknowledgement of, of, of the changed map. I thought Lavrov, his foreign minister, was sounding more conciliatory because he, he was changing the goalposts. And he said, well, we also, it's not just about we don't want to take over Ukraine. We don't want to run Ukraine. We are willing to recognize Ukraine as a separate nation, almost, he seemed to suggest. But we need the rights of the Russian people in Ukraine, the rights to acknowledge the Russian language, etc. So I think he's changing the goalposts. Well, Lavrov think, is changing think, the goalpost, I think. Uh, well, 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 that remains to be seen. You know, the division in population is not the <laughs> something you can call with a red line on a map. It's kind of a bad case of measles. Uh, in terms of Ukrainian speakers and Catholics being mixed with Russians and uh, Eastern Orthodox. But the, the division geographically I laid out is where the predominance of the, of the Russophile population lives. Uh, and I think also this is a game, a propaganda game. Neither the Russian side nor the Ukrainian side wants to look like they're the obstacle in the peace talks. I think at the moment, uh, it's not likely that much will come out of them. If there were a ceasefire, 
I think many military experts would say they think that's primarily to benefit the Russians to give them time to resupply and regroup. Uh, do you think uh, with all of this, you know, it often happens that that uh, the leader may talk big at home, but quietly behind the scenes, we've been hearing also about some contact between Russia and America, back channel contact. Uh, it could be likely. I mean, after all, these two countries have had these back-channel contact for years now. So something oh, could sure. be... Those, those, yeah. Sure, those, those could go on all the time. I think uh, part of the contact may be, and there was an announcement today that uh, uh, the U.S. National Security Advisor had spoken to Nikolai Patrushev, who is his counterpart, was my counterpart when I was there. Uh, that could be about the Iran nuclear deal, too. That's another possibility. Uh, it could be about the man, our man at the uh, International Space Station that's coming back down in a Russian rocket. It could be about a lot of things. But as I say, I don't think the Russians want to be on the side of looking like they are the obstruction uh, to a negotiated peace. But, uh, but the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss of the United Kingdom said this morning she was skeptical about these talks. And I have to say that's pretty much where I am as well. Okay. Uh, John Bolton, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you very much. That's John Bolton, former U.S. National Security Advisor. Let's go straight to the debate this evening. And the hashtag is Putin's looking a little nervous. And Natalia, Natalia Katsa uh, Buchkovska is a former member of parliament uh, of Ukraine. She's there on the top left of your screen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Mark Finland, head of the arms proliferation at the Geneva Study Center for Security Policy. And he's also vice president of the Inter Initiatives for Nuclear Disarmament. He's joining us from Geneva. Peter Guznik on the top right of your screen there, ladies and gentlemen. And joining us from, uh, for, from Moscow is Dr. Fyodor, Dr. Fyodor uh, Wojtolovsky. Uh, Dr. Fyodor is joining us from Moscow. He's director of the Primakov Institute. Uh, Dr. Hussein. Bagay is joining us, chairman of the Foreign Policy Institute from Ankara in Turkey. Marina, Marina Kolesnikova is a geopolitical analyst joining us from Bishek in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, finally, Barshid Bagarian, Eurasia Director at the West Asia Research Center, is joining us from Tehran. Um, uh, you know, Marina, I want to start with you. This, uh, the sense that I got and when I, when I heard what Putin said was an acknowledgement of difficulty. For the first time, he's beginning to acknowledge difficulty. He's repeatedly saying we must not be divided, we must stay together. Then he's talking about inflation. Then he's talking about price rise. Then he's talking about the loss of jobs. And then he's saying, I'm going to double up the benefits. I'm going to increase benefits. So it looks, it looks like he's in some difficulty. What do you think? I mean, you know, he's saying, don't get demoralized, keep well, up. So what do you think? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can. Marina. Uh, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, very much, loud and clear. Very good. So from day one, uh, our President Putin, and as well as uh, all the senior advisors, admitted that it was going to be a very difficult campaign. And it's not uh, some uh, uh, drumming, dr uh, beating the drums military campaign where you are going to shut down, annihilate uh, whole cities, whole civilian populations, and declare one's victory, as it was in Yugoslavia, Libya, as it was in uh, an attempt uh, was to destroy Syria mm -hmm. as well. No, quite the contrary. Everything can be, has been done to preserve life to preserve lives of civilians, to preserve lives of the Ukrainian milit military, uh, soldiers in the field, and that is why the progress is not as rapid as one, one might uh, imagine. But uh, neither in Russia ever expected it to be rapid. Everyone understood that it's especially difficult, considering that uh, the Ukrainian armed forces as well as gangs in the field, gangs that were armed uh, without even t uh, asking their documents, their licenses, everyone was just uh, handed out weapons. So those gangs, and as well as the military, as well as the Nazis in land, they just take civilians as hostages. Okay. Right now, uh, a few hours ago, we uh, heard 
that actually in Mariupol, the Nazis are holding civilians as prisoners, and their Nazi headquarters is, in fact, in Audio. the building of the theater, uh, and civilians are uh, held as uh, hostages, and uh, that's what they are doing. They are not allowing civilians to leave the cities, the towns. So, of course, it takes time and incredible skill, incredible precision, and that's exactly what is going on. Uh, okay, and so yes, Russian people totally support their president, and now uh, nearly every Russian feels like it was during the Great pa Patriotic War where you might criticize Stalin, where, where, when you might like and dislike Putin. No, no, but it's not about. Putin is our leader. No, okay, it's not about like or dislike. It's not. It's not about like or dislike. I just, I, I've just been listening to how he was been speaking, and and uh, when this all started, uh, Putin was full of bravado. He was playing the nuclear card. He was playing the fear card. He was being very bold. He was talking about a decisive victory. I'm just saying the tone has changed right now. His behavior, his tone is more explanatory. It's more reconciliatory. It's, it's more, let's stay together. Let's hang in there. And, you know, we, I'll help you out. We'll have difficulty. The tone has changed. The tone has clearly changed from two weeks back and now. There's no doubt on that. What, do you agree with me, Fyodor? I mean, I'm seeing it every day. The tone is changing. No. no. Uh, I would like to, I would like to say that to we have to analyze not the tone, but the operation. The operation is going like it has been planned. You know, it is, it has its own dynamic. Uh, of course, uh, there were uh, experts who believe that it can be much faster. Uh, and even in the United States, there, there, there were experts who have been saying that uh, it, it will be realized in two weeks. No, it's complicated military operation uh, because uh, Russian forces are trying to preserve uh, big cities from uh, huge damages. Uh, Russia is trying to preserve lives of uh, civilians. And of course, Russia doesn't uh, want to waste its own military officers and soldiers. And uh, the dynamics of operation are much slower than many expected, but uh, it goes further and further, and uh, it uh, creates uh, the position, military position, which can uh, give a Russian Federation a political uh, background for uh, negotiating uh, peace conditions with the Ukrainian government. Okay. I would like to stress that from the beginning, Russian Federation is not uh, declining to talk with Ukrainian side and is uh, officially saying that President Zelensky and his government are still in power, but uh, Russian Federation is having its own military and political uh, uh, goals yeah, yeah, Dr. On, on Ukrainian territory. Uh, Dr. Fyodor, I get, let, let me get a view from the other side. I mean, I'm just saying that I, I, I remember the comment that was made, Peter, by, by Putin on the 23rd or 24th of February, when he basically said that we're going to nuke the hell out of you. Essentially, that's what he said. He said, Russia's response will be immediate. We will, Russia will lead the world to such consequences that the world will never have faced that in its history. That was the tone. That was the tone on 23rd. And today he's saying there is inflation, there is unemployment, we are losing jobs, but this is like COVID. We came together in COVID. We will adapt like COVID, but COVID was a period of uncertainty. So I'm just saying, I'm only comparing Putin. I'm comparing Putin of 16th March to the Putin of 24th of February. I don't see the same tone. Peter. No, Ar Arnab, Arnab you're, you're absolutely right. You know, some of the reality is finally getting through to Putin now. He's been living in this bubble, a bubble of disinformation and lies. And now it's clear that the Russian economy is suffering very, very seriously. The Russian military has been embarrassed. They didn't, they expected some kind of lightning strike to take Kyiv. It didn't happen. The Ukrainian resistance has been much, much stronger than anybody anticipated. Putin is isolated. What's happened is the opposite of what he wanted. It, what's happened is that NATO is strengthened. NATO is further resolved. The U.S. has increased its troops in Europe from 80,000 to 100,000. The world, for the most part, is united against Russia now, and Russia's position in the world is much weakened. 
Putin's own position has been greatly diminished in his own stature and his own legacy. So this has been a disaster politically, <coughs> militarily, economically, strategically, and morally for Russia. And uh, if anybody, if, the, if Modi and Xi Jinping and others can prevail on Putin to end this as quickly as possible, that's the best thing, not only for the Ukrainians, not only for the Russians, but for the rest of the world, with the danger of this escalating into a much broader confrontation and possibly world war. So I'm, I'm looking at the signals here right now, and I, I'm just looking at what Putin has said here, and, and I'm looking at whether Putin is looking uh, for a way out, because, you know, there's been contact between Jake Sullivan, who's uh, the national security advisor of the U.S., and uh, Russian General Nikolay Patrushev. Now, uh, my question there is, uh, uh, Dr. Hussein, uh, that's big. I think the fact that there has been contact is massive because it shows that you know, both sides have begun a process of negotiation. Now, they can say the talks are about Iran, but essentially it's contact between two major policymakers, isn't it? Yes, uh, I think today Turkish Foreign Minister met uh, uh, Russian uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, last week uh, in Antalya. Russian foreign minister and uh, Ukrainian foreign minister were there. I was also listening to their uh, to their speeches there, and also uh, we had a big uh, important meeting. Uh, but the fact is, uh, Turkey tries uh, to bring uh, two sides uh, together, uh, Zelensky and uh, Putin, as, as much as uh, as soon as possible. I don't know whether it will be the case, but you are right. Uh, it is getting more and more difficult now for uh, uh, for uh, Turkish side because the uh, conflict is getting much uh, harder and uh, we will see how uh, how in the coming days uh, the uh, how in the coming days the situation will improve or not improve so so yeah you know okay so we began by saying the tone has changed or oh, let's let's look at it i want to go to mark finod who's head of arms proliferation at the geneva center uh, mark you may have been you may have been, you've also been a very senior former diplomat you may have been seeing the the responses from putin's side till say 3 weeks back it's 3 weeks since the war and uh, and 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 uh, the the russian army is still stuck about 12 15 miles outside kiev in the cities of chernikiv mariupol kharkiv uh, very strong Ukrainian uh, uh, resistance. Uh, 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 the, a, major, a major general of the Russian army has been killed, the fourth top officer to have been killed. And also the Chinese are playing a little safe of late. I, I, I feel that China has refused to supply Moscow with aircraft parts to the aviation sector. That's already been hit by crippling sanctions. That's a message that Beijing is sending to, to Russia that it's time to end this. Do you read it this way? Mark. Yes, uh, obviously there have been uh, many attempts uh, to warn uh, Putin before the invasion uh, that it would be a disaster. Uh, he didn't listen to uh, the various attempts of uh, the German uh, uh, prime, uh, chancellor, the uh, pre French president, the Israeli uh, prime minister, uh, the secretary general of the UN, the head of the Red Cross. And, and now even if these... Uh, actors, these mediators, uh, uh, try to keep some dialogue to, to uh, influence uh, the, the policy choices of the Russian president. We, we can see that he's hardly listening to anyone. He's just continuing uh, his plan. And, uh, and he's also facing this uh, military uh, stalemates. Uh, you know, situation, uh, and and as we know, in war, and uh, this was stated by an American senator after uh, the be the beginning of World War One, the first casualty of war is truth, and we can see that this is also ongoing. Uh, this uh, propaganda war, this uh, uh, psychological operations. Uh, now it's at the same time more difficult to convince anyone uh, because the the lies are just so blatant in face of uh, the reality that everyone can witness. Uh, but at the same time, the new technologies can <clears throat> give more impact uh, to this propaganda. So in any case, uh, the, these efforts for dialogue uh, pressure from the international community have to continue. And, and this has to lead to a, a ceasefire or, or uh, at least a, a cessation of hostilities. 
Okay, uh, Farshid, uh, he needs uh, he needs a victory. Putin can't afford to lose. More importantly, Putin can't afford to be seen to lose. But will the West allow him that optics, or will he have to yeah, find? Thank you, yeah, Farshid. Okay, so it seems that uh, Mr. Putin is losing his tone. I agree with you because uh, uh, there is some some important points. First of all, this KGLA war is not working right now, and the second, uh, we can compare the Russia with the United States because the United States till now spent that more than two hundred trillion dollar for veterans, and in, in Russia we have no such a f figure of money, and for this reason, uh, Mr. Putin cannot spend and cannot accept the veterans. So he has to, to go on. And there is no power to stop Mr. Putin. The only power to stop Mr. Putin is the structure of Russia. Nobody else. Uh, we appreciate all of these negotiations, all of these peacekeeping, ceasefire negotiations, but none of, none of them will work against Mr. Putin. And Mr. Putin will stop with the uh, uh, Russia itself. For example, there is another, uh, on 24th of March, there is another negotiation and, uh, I mean, summit for the NATO. And uh, I'm, I'm, um, uh, it's strange for me, what kind of decision in NATO were made openly? And all of the, the decisions made by NATO are confidential and high classified. So it means that something has changed and the, the United States is right now is one to, to prolonging this war. Not Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin will, will stop by, by Ukraine. But the United States is, has no will to stop this fire because they want to, to they want Russia to lose all its power and the empire will collapse uh, completely. That is the fact. So for this reason, I agree with you and the tone is different because uh, Mr. Putin has uh, lost three generals in the, in the war, maybe four. I, I don't know, maybe the fourth one is uh, under news right now. And Mr. Putin, uh, Mr. Putin changed the, the mechanism of the uh, war machine, and this is—it means that something is changing uh, radically in the war machine of the of the uh, Russia. And we will accept, we will accept this that Russia has nuclear power and Russia has biochemical power. Yeah, but they but played the nuclear we will card face in coming days. But they played the nuclear card, Farshid. It hasn't, they played the nuclear card on the 24th, 23rd, threatening the world with catastrophe, with Lavrov's comments uh, in response to what the British Foreign Secretary said. The, Russia has played the nuclear card three or four times already. Yeah, they Russia are playing because play uh, when all. you play with the card, it means that you have to use it. And this is not only for pronouncing. And they are showing... They're showing the edge of the war, the edge of the Russian empire to the war. That's no, but, the fact. You know, so, for example... Uh, okay. Yeah. No, no, I, I was just saying that the, the Russian people also... Well, see, see, this war, this war... Farshid, I'm just looking at this way. Fyodor will understand this better. I actually want to go to Natalia also. Natalia, just a minute, I'm coming to you. You see, Fyodor... Uh, the people of Russia have been affected. The people of Russia will lose jobs, reduce manufacturing. Uh, they, will lose, they will lose a lot. Definitely. And 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 the people of Russia, at some point of time, whatever, however you may control the media, dissent, etc., will begin to ask, what are we doing this for? What are we doing no. this for? And, and Putin, as a leader, will be conscious, will be conscious that while he has spoken about Russian history, you know, Ukraine is not even a country, it's part of Russia, we have historical links, etc. Uh, at one point of time, you know, war cannot be fought on an empty stomach. And if China no. begins to get edgy, and China also begins to, like it's showing signs right now, that it's not giving 100% support to Russia anymore, especially last six or seven days, Dr. Fyodor, then even Putin will have to do something else, right? Uh, thank you. Uh, look, uh, from the beginning, from 2014, when uh, the crisis in Eastern Ukraine has started, Russia has been under Western sanctions. And with uh, each attempt of Russian Federation to uh, restore peace and stability uh, uh, based on Minsk agreements, uh, we had a new round of sanctions from the United States and uh, European Union. From the beginning, it has been a war with economic instruments because everybody in NATO understands how dangerous uh, can be the direct conflict with Russia. Concerning economy and concerning uh, social situation, of course, uh, all Russians are uh, um, affected by uh, sanctions which uh, uh, the United States and Europe and European Union 
uh, have applied uh, on Russian Federation. Of course, our private enterprise is suffering. Of course, uh, a lot of people are feeling by themselves uh, the pressure of sanctions. But uh, uh, in case you are using instruments like this, you should take into account Russian psychology. Because in Russian psychology uh, and in our uh, political addicts, when somebody is rising pressure on us, we are resisting stronger and stronger. In this sense, uh, it was the worst way uh, to uh, have a dialogue with Russia from the beginning, from the beginning of politics of sanctions. And especially right now, when sanctions uh, from the instrument of political pressure ha have converted into massive uh, bombings, uh, but massive bombings uh, in okay. economic terms, not in uh, military, of course. No, no, I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> what I see as an opportunity is uh, the dialogue directly between the United States and Russia on Ukrainian yes. case. Yes. The dialogue between Russia and NATO yes. about the future of Ukraine and the future of relations between uh, Russia and NATO and uh, stability and peace in Europe. Right now, we see the results of pressure uh, uh, and attempts <clears throat> of uh, Western community of the United States and NATO to engage Ukraine into their sphere of influence. And we see what is happening. We see all this tragedy but not the Russia has started it. Yes, okay, so I, I, I'd like to get Natalia in. Natalia, you've heard all that, and essentially what, what, what Dr. Fyodor is saying would seem to bypass Ukraine, and so let's let Russia and uh, let Russia and the United States directly have talks, which is exactly what, exactly what Putin has wanted from day one. But I don't think America will agree to that, bypassing Ukraine. What do you think? Because the people okay. of Ukraine have suffered. Yes, first of all, uh, good day for everyone, and uh, I, I just listen, and I'm really shocked uh, how the truth is uh, reverted, and uh, Russia, Russia Federation invaded Ukraine, and now we have very tragic, uh, tragic uh, results as a uh, lot of civilians, I think uh, five, eight thousand all at especially with those cities which is surrounded like uh, uh, our city of Mariupol, which now has a very huge humanitarian crisis. So Russian troops also targeted civilians, uh, civilians uh, uh, life quarters. So it's already 2,000 life quarters uh, destroyed. Our schools, more than 400 schools, more than 100 kids are killed. So actually it's a very aggressive, bloody war and uh, specially designed and specially targeted on civilian uh, population. So it's, this is the true. And Ukrainians are resisting, and it's very evident that since war started to three weeks, uh, Russia could not take any big city because not only uh, army, but also territorial forces and people by themselves with just empty hands, they are opposing and they are showing that we are independent state. We don't want to be occupied. We couldn't be occupied, and no one will live under this occupation. This is the position of Ukraine. We are not the object of negotiation. We are subject and Ukraine will decide whom to join, when to join and how to behave. And people are express this very clearly and uh, loud that no, we don't want any Russian words, any Soviet Union restoration, etc, etc. So now it's become very, very evident. So this is our position uh, not to allow any occupation. What if, what uh, and if, what any if, aggression no, what if, what if Putin says, what if Putin says, Natalia, that let the war continue till May, let it continue till June, let it be relentless. I have enough reserves. I will keep attacking and you know he did he did bomb uh, Zaporizhka and 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 there have been blasts in Kiev in in Dnipro in you have seen exactly what has happened in Mariupol what if Putin says I'm going to take this through till I win let there be devastation let us let us continue let's see what the US does I'm not going to attack NATO but I will continue hammering Ukraine uh this is what is going on now. So he is attacking uh, uh, civilian cities uh, and our infrastructure, which is very much destroyed. And for the other side, people are ready to fight and defend uh, their homes and their land. And it's uh, evident, it's uh, clear now. So since war started, you see that uh, this is a heroic 
defense of our land. Secondly, uh, Ukraine will not surround it. And uh, we will defend our land by the win, because we really believe that Ukraine can win this unfair and uh, unequal war, because on, uh, we are on the right side of this. Uh, of this uh, so, so uh, Ma Ma Marina, what is the game plan? I mean, is Putin is... Putin, what is the game plan? Just continue, continue bombing more cities, is it? I mean, continuously the war is... Uh, initially, it was to demilitarize Ukraine. That was the target. I don't know what the target is anymore. I don't know what the target uh, is anymore. But the, cost, but the cost on, the cost on, the cost on, the, on Russia is also major, you know? Can you afford this conflict to carry on till May, for example? Can you, can you really uh, afford it? Dear sir, you so greatly honor me by stating that I, that I can convey the plans and ideas of uh, President Putin here. Uh, I would like to know what are the uh, inner plans uh, and ideas of uh, President Putin, but uh, people trust him and people know that he will do his best. Moreover, there is uh, evidence, overwhelming evidence, that uh, Putin and his advisors and Mr. Lavrov incessantly kept trying to negotiate peacefully with uh, the West, with the Ukraine. And in fact, uh, a few hours, just a few hours before the uh, military operation, Putin spoke and sent a clear message a peace offering to Mr. Zelensky. All the former had to do is just to withdraw and cease fire, cease shelling the people of Donetsk. On some strange reason, people tend to forget or just ignore the 15,000 casualties, civilian casualties killed in Donetsk over these eight years. They, their children killed with their Hello. mothers. Somehow they ignore this. And you must remember and you must know when the Russian people, Russian common people on the ground face the existential threat and there is now clear and truthful evidence of existential threat to the Russian yeah. civilization and to the very state and people of Russia. We shall stand and we shall stay strong against it. So your point is that Putin is not going to waver. All the Russian people will stand unitedly behind Putin. This is not going to have an economic fallout. It's an ideal situation for Russia, but it's tough to believe. 60% of your oil goes to Europe, right? And, and, and if there is a WTO expulsion, that could allow all WTO members to ramp up tariffs on Russian imports and indefin indefinitely discriminate against Russian products. And that trade amounts to 25% of Russia's GDP. And, and at the end of the day, militarily also, I mean, NATO, NATO is much larger, much, much more powerful than Russia, military terms, direct to direct to direct, you know, comparison out there. So, especially after the battering the Russians have taken. Question here is, now, Peter, we're taking it to the point, some of the Russians say, let it continue forever. Let's see what happens. Let's see what the West does. Can they, is that just bluster or can they follow it through? It's mostly bluster, but this war could go on for months. It could go on for years. You know, uh, uh, Natalia was talking about the suffering of the Ukrainian people. This is nothing compared to what we might see. If this war goes on, we know that Russia's got, what, another 700,000 troops that it can throw into this fight. It hasn't used most of its smart weapons yet. Yep. It's got military capabilities that might not be able to defeat the Ukrainians, but we sure, they sure can make them suffer. Yep. They can flatten those cities. They can target civilians. And they, they can just throw so much more firepower into this than the Ukrainians can get. And, and now with Zelensky today appealing to the U.S. Congress, <laughs> calling for a no-fly zone, which would be insanity, because that would mean U.S. fighting Russian troops and the start of <clears throat> World War III. Yeah. So that's so that why won't I mean, happen. That won't happen. When you look at the, the, the images of the suffering of the Ukrainian people, it breaks people's hearts. You're not seeing it in Russia. You might not be seeing it in Bishkek. But the rest of the world is seeing this, and that, and which is why it's so urgent that we get a, a, a solution now quickly. 
Something yeah. that allows Putin to claim Fyodor. some kind of victory. Uh, if we'll I, have new, if I may. They've accepted neutrality. And, and uh, Fyodor so wants let, to respond, Peter. Fyodor, yes, Fyodor. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I think uh, we, what we see now is uh, the situation in which uh, the United States and NATO countries have been uh, uh, initiating uh, Ukrainian wish to join the Euro-Atlantic community, to be part of the Euro-Atlantic community for years. And uh, in this situation, when, uh, uh, you know, we have the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, uh, we have uh, uh, Ukraine asking for uh, military aid, uh, direct military engagement of uh, no-fly zone, that means direct military engagement, we understand what it means. Uh, uh, when it is asking NATO for direct military engagement, we see that, that NATO uh, is uh, doing step aside, that it is uh, much more interesting conflict between Russia and Ukraine than in uh, any uh, um, peaceful no, reconciliation. I think, I think at the same time, Peter, you know, I, 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 think, I think America has also got to have a Western interest in ending this. You know, I think Jake Sullivan's meeting with the Russian general is a step in that direction. Mark. I think I think the the Americans also have a vested interest in ending this. For Jake all the Sullivan and Mr. Patrushev are having regular contacts during all the uh, du during the last two years, and uh, it's, it needs uh, to be more now. It needs to be more aggressive, more often, more frequent now. Mark, Mark. They're very good, very good. Yes, uh, I think uh, you know if the 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 Russian obsession is about NATO getting closer to its borders. Uh, this uh, war actually will lead to exactly the opposite result because actually Russia, by occupying Ukraine, is moving closer to NATO and it's encouraging countries who feel threatened by Russia, such as Sweden yeah. and, and uh, Finland, also to join NATO. So that really counterproductive yeah. uh, completely if, if this was the, the objective. Uh, but more than this, I think we should just keep repeating that whatever disputes there were, whatever disagreements yeah, yeah, with yeah. Ukraine, you know, yeah. with the West, yeah. uh, you know, th these are the, yeah. funda the fundamental basis of the uh, international yes. system put for uh, put into place after world without war without doubt now mark I, I i feel i feel if i can you just know, in conclusion just, uh, say that i do feel today that the, the mood thoughts. has changed putin is talking differently and if you see the nature of the discussion also everyone's getting a little war weary they want this to end and I think that's a good sign. Let's see where it goes. Ladies and gentlemen, on the other side, why I'm personally appalled that people are taking it out on the streets, calling for buns after a court verdict on the hijab issue. Absolutely unnecessary. See you in a few minutes.